is uh, Joseph Pitawanakut. I'm from Wikom Kong on uh, Manitoulin Island. I uh, teach about plant-based medicine, about Nishnavem Shkitke, how we use all of the different plants as medicine. We have about 220, 230 different species of plants that we use and that we teach about. But all of these different plants, all these different trees and medicines that are out there, are, are, they're all um, new friends. And it's basically the same way that any relationship works. Whenever you meet somebody for the first time, you want to be, you, you want to learn what their name is. You know, you don't go up to somebody and ask them a bunch of random questions. You say, what's your, who are you? What's your name? And then what we do is we ask, you know, what do you love doing? Uh, where do you like playing? What's your favorite activity? What are you good at? What's your gift? Um, and, th and then we, and, and we tell them what our gift is too. Uh, that's the best way, I think, to understand them is that they are new friends and we are going to be uh, engaging in a relationship with them where we're going to be able to take something from them. But we need to remember that it's important for us to learn how we can give something back to them to help them so that we're engaging in a reciprocal uh, good relationship. A lot of the different medicines that we use, they are all plant medicines that help heal to help restore normal function to certain parts of our body. And those corresponding body parts contained within that plant is what uh, protocol needs to happen in order for us to be able to heal. There's a plant here, it's called Gazibnashk. And Gazibnashk, it's uh, Equisetum haimali uh, um, or uh, scouring Russian English. We call it Kanmshkikke. We call it bone medicine. And what we could see with this plant is that uh, it's got joints. And in each of these joints, there is a fluid. Obviously, that fluid is frozen now. But in the summertime, that fluid is slippery, just like the fluid inside of our joints. The synovial fluid is this really slippery fluid. Uh, but when you're looking at the uh, a cross section of the stem, the stem's got uh, a really hard part on the outside it has a spongy part in the middle and a hollow center that's the way this plant is structured so just like every single bone in your body where you have that hard periosteum on the outside the hard part of your bone and then you have spongy bone in the middle and a hollow center for marrow we remember this as konshkike as bone medicine and you could see the identity of this plant embedded in and throughout the geometry of it contained within this plant is the original instruction if this was used to create this part of our body this has the original instruction to allow uh, disease that has occurred in our body to heal and we do that just by drinking tea with it this is one of my favorite plants to be able to show us how important it is to utilize Anishinaabe Atsuin, Anishinaabe knowledge to be able to, uh, or to, to be the vehicle necessary to access this kind of knowledge. Okay, so um, beach, we call it Ajawe Mish. And uh, what's super, super interesting about that, Ajawe is when something is going through something else, like a piercing. Uh, so a shawe suin is a tattoo. And uh, so a shawe mish is the tattoo tree. And it's really neat because it's what we use. You could carve into this tree and, uh, and it doesn't die. It's able to recover very well. People use it for marking. So it's really nice to be able to uh, see the, the um, how the accuracy of our language in being able to depict uh, um, and and convey the identity of a of a species. Uh, so, but it goes even farther than that because if you take the bark from the roots of this tree, you make a tea. It's like a nice, beautiful, ambery orange color. And when you mix blood with that, it turns pitch black. And this is the tree that we would use. Uh, in giving traditional tattoos. Um, so not only a Jawe Mish, 
the name of this tree to be tattoo tree because you can give it tattoos, but it gives us tattoos. This is another example of why Anishinaabe and knowledge is needed in the pursuit of understanding our natural world and then uh, how important it is to understand the natural world itself. So another example is uh, Kishigandak. This is cedar, eastern white cedar, Thuja occidentalis. We could look at this plant to understand how this part of our body works by assessing the way that this plant promotes the healing of it or of our lymphatic system. Um, but what I really wanted us to be able to focus on is just the, sh is the identity of this tree. What we need to do is look at this tree and say, hi, <laughs> who are you? Uh, what makes you special? What makes you unique? What separates you from all of the other trees? And with that, we're going to be able to look at, okay, it's an evergreen, so it has foliage all year. Um, but that, um, it, it, uh, what makes this different than all of the other evergreens is that it doesn't have needles. It has flat, green, scaly looking leaves. And let's look at that feature and say, what are you trying to tell me? And what it's trying to, what it's showing us is that this medicine looks or is identically and geometrically exactly the same as our lymphatic system. And so everything outside is a reflection of you. And there is an opportunity to connect with that. There is a vehicle that we can utilize that will help get us to that understanding. And in this part of the world, that vehicle is Anishinaabe Adsoin, is Anishinaabe knowledge, is our knowledge. We, we have been here for thousands of years utilizing these strategies, remembering them, uh, and we're here to share them with you, to allow you to be able to connect to these really important knowledges that are out there. Hi, I'm Haley from Natural Curiosity, and as an educator, um, I just wanted to share how important it is to get outside with your students when learning about science and learning about STEM, because it's so important to provide experiences to your students to engage with the natural world, to support that kind of learning so that um, it can be real and authentic and meaningful and purposeful and enjoyable. Environmental inquiry places students' questions, wonders, and ideas at the center of their learning, responding to their lead as they construct meaning through engagement and the natural world. Deepened by Indigenous perspectives, the four-branch framework of natural curiosity finds common ground with Indigenous values in many important ways and reflects an emerging sense of respect for Indigenous knowledge among educators. The first branch in natural curiosity is inquiry and engagement, which is connected to the Indigenous perspective of heart-based learning. How do we light the fire within all learners in our classroom so that they are excited to be learning about STEM? When students' voices, interests, and hearts are honored, their learning can be deeper and more meaningful. The second branch in natural curiosity is experiential learning. And this involves hands-on experiences, but it also involves minds-on and hearts-on experiences that can help students understand complex concepts in real life. This connects with the Indigenous perspective of sending out roots. When we get outside to have real experiences, we are also deepening our connection to the place that we are in. Research has also shown that spending significant time outside leads to greater stewardship behavior than content acquisition. The third branch is integration. Integrated learning transcends subject areas as educators encourage students to see connections among disciplines and draw upon content and skills from multiple areas. Outside the artificial boundaries of some classroom settings, students' questions and thoughts about the world are seldom contained within a single discipline. If we place their questions and ideas at the core of STEM learning, then our approach has no choice but to incorporate different perspectives, skills, and ways of understanding, including Indigenous knowledge. 
The fourth branch is moving towards sustainability, which challenges educators to move away from one-off learning experiences or even single acts of environmental stewardship. It's about forming reciprocal and lasting relationships with the natural world over time. The Indigenous lens on the fourth branch is breathing with the world. Everything changes if we shift from asking how we fostered stewardship in students to asking how we help them relate to their world, love their world, and value reciprocity with all our relations. Really the only place that this can be properly uh, taught uh, is outside. Um, and I think, you know, as educators who have access to these kinds of presentations and who authentically engage with the knowledge presented in them and who, who want to provide this for their students, um, that there is, that, that responsibility is kind of on you, the educator. And, uh, and so when we do not have access, ready, steady access to green space, um, we do this like with pictures, with posters, but still holding fast to the, the, the real most authentic place that this kind of education can occur is going to be out on the land, actively engaging and, and with it and pursuing it where it exists. <laughs> Incorporating Indigenous perspectives presents an exciting opportunity for educators and students to apply their learning in STEM through reciprocity with their local natural world and in partnership with local Indigenous peoples wherever possible. To quote the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, from an Indigenous perspective, reconciliation remains incomplete unless we are also reconciled with the natural world. Reconciliation is the work of all Canadians and educators have an integral role in this process. Taking students outside to learn on the land is an authentic way to engage with Indigenous perspectives and to honour the um, ideas and learning and knowledge and science that has been on this land since time immemorial.